Can you take a second to introduce yourself, say hello? If you do know them, talk for a second, I guess. <laughs> Sorry? Hi, Sharon. We just want to begin by recognizing that we are on Occupy Hobby Ocean. It's Hobby Ocean again. Because you moved through campus today and every day, please recognize that. Um, so we just have a few announcements before we go on to our drown bag. Okay, all week, WIMPs will have resource packets that will help you support the water packages of Standing Rock, all the way from Hamilton. So if you look right here, okay, over there, <laughs> there's a table um, that has resources that you can use to support um, that movement. And next week, we have an amazing guest speaker being brought by Oasis, Helen Zia. Helen Zia is a Chinese American journalist and activist. Zia played a crucial role in bringing federal civil rights charges against the perpetrators of Vincent Chin's murder and igniting an Asian American response to the hate crime through her journalism and advocacy work. You do not want to miss this brown bag. It is Tuesday of next week. So Monday at once at 6 p.m., the network in Haven will be having a study break. So stop by for treats and relaxation before we and into this really stressful, hopefully not stressful time. Um, so if you are not signed up to receive our WIMS outreach emails, this clipboard will be going around. Please sign up for outreach. Um, please remember that if you need to leave during the presentation, be mindful of the people around you and the presenters as quietly as possible. Also, can you please clean up after yourselves? And um, there is compost and there are compost bins and trash cans in the back, so please put your trash and compost there. And um, if you are able, please help us put chairs away at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll now turn it over to you. So the way it's going to work is that Rachel is going to read a statement at the end of the day because we can tell to all of its members who are attending the conference, um, and then I want us to do like just a little slight activity, and then our moderator will be the hand. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I was going to read part of the statement because it's very long, but um, it says we encourage our NWSA members to stand with, defend, and provide sanctuary for our students and colleagues who are most vulnerable. In these challenging times, we must embrace and reclaim the activist groups that carved out a place for women's and gender studies and other interdisciplinary critical areas of study within the academy over 40 years ago. In addition to recognizing the continued importance of the rigorous and clarifying scholarship that has been the hallmark of NWSA members, we also encourage members to organize teaching <coughs> and to explore ever more creative forms of learning, sharing, and mobilizing. Speak out loudly and consistently through letters, petitions, and collective statements. We cannot, we cannot accept the skewed argument that it is not our place or it is somehow unprofessional to speak out. On the contrary, speak out we must. It is our ethical obligation to do so. And in doing so, we are inspired and empowered by our collective effort. Um, and then we're, the activity we're going to do is Long Island from the first workshop I went to. And it's a way of like remembering ourselves, but through our mother's lineage. So if you do or don't know the person next to you, I'd like you to turn to them and just say that like, my name is Ashley Andrew Poku. I am the daughter of who was the daughter of, and then just have like a little conversation about that for like a minute, and then we'll get back to the questions. We get back. <laughs> Um, 
And the idea of the conference was to like bring professors um, and educators from all different like sectors and across countries teaching um, various topics to talk about what they're doing and like why they find it interesting and how it fits under the theme of decoloniality. So it was three to four days long. So it was like three to four days long, and every single day there was like we got this huge booklet and it ran from like 8 a.m. to 6:30 p.m. And they had blocks, and in those blocks was like all of the things going on. Like, they like have the eight a.m. schedule, um, so then we just got to pick and decide which workshop like piques our interest and what we want to go to. Okay, so what was it like being in Canada after the political election and the climate here? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so what was it like being in Canada right after the election? I thought it would actually be relaxing to get away from Colgate and go to Canada. And I remember after watching the elections with my friends, I was like, wow, I can't wait to leave to go to the NWSA and just like get away from it. <clears throat> but um, there wasn't really a getting away from it because I think that it, like you felt the, I think the vibe of the conference was definitely changed by what happened with the election. So it was like very like sorrowful or like in the, way people spoke, even when they presented, and then also just like in the general atmosphere of the entire conference, even though it was in Canada, there was like a doom or like a cloud over everyone's head, um, and everyone talked about it, even when we got to the border, and the person was like taking all of our passports, he was like, oh, you're from America? And we're like, yeah, he's like, are you here to apply for refugee, or like, <laughs> we're like, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> stayed at an Airbnb and the man that like owned the Airbnb was like, I'm so sorry, but at least you get to be here for now. Um, and everyone in the church, every workshop I went to was like to uh, address it or to like speak on it. But I remember being very angry after the election. And like I think what no matter what anyone said, like no matter what any presenter said, like I was just still angry. So when people acknowledge it, I was like, damn, like don't acknowledge it in Canada, you're gonna ruin the air here. And then <laughs> also like some presenters like wanted to be more optimistic and be like, we've survived worse, we'll like, get over this. And I was like, but I don't want to get over this. Um, so yeah, so I think I was like very angry the entire time because of what happened. But then just like going to Canada and knowing that like it literally had like changed the entire atmosphere of the conference and of my mood being at the conference. Um, yeah, similar to what Ashley Andre said, I think I had a pretty difficult, I think we all had a 
pretty difficult time to some extent because uh, did we leave the day after the election? Like mm -hmm. two days? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it was just like Colgate was obviously pretty terrible. <laughs> and then like um, we just kind of left. So I felt like there wasn't really much time to kind of process what had happened. And then we were just kind of thrown into this different environment where, um, yeah, people were just like jumping into kind of political debates about the election and things like that. And I felt like we weren't maybe ready for that. Um, and there was kind of like a disconnect for them of talking about it from a Canadian perspective. And I think that allowed them to get into a more like argumentative kind of mode where I was like, I just don't even want to speak to you like right now kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was hard. Yeah, I think sometimes we just, or I sometimes have this idea that like you leave Colgate and everything's better, but like a lot of the problems that are at Colgate are obviously systemic issues that can be amplified when you're here, but they don't disappear. So, yeah. Um, how did the conference live up to the theme of decolonizing? Yeah, so, um, this is going to show the snap of us, which thumbs up, I would do it. Um, <laughs> and if you can't see it, it says, when academia be like through the lens of um, discursive analysis of socially constructed temporality of the institution and the way in which the neoliberal moment, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so, it was like really, I don't know necessarily if it like lived up to its name and the way like the conference is like ran. I think a lot of the talks that I tried to go up to lived up to the theme of like trying to deconstruct um, what we consider to be like knowledge and what we consider to be important. But for me, I had a problem with the way it was like overall ran, because I know that it can only happen once a year, once every couple of years, but everyone was so on top of each other. And even with that, I remember we went to a, um, a presentation, was it, I believe, uh, yeah, for Alicia Morton was there, right? So she was having a presentation, but then also in the same night, Professor Cerno was having a presentation, and they were like two rooms like apart, so that they like, go from one room to like listen to Professor Morton, and then like run out of that room to go listen to Professor Cerno, and I was I found that to be problematic because I wanted to know like how can you deconstruct like colonialism and all this other type of stuff when you have women of color and like like we're talking about their just disciplines, but you like have put them over each other. And I felt like that happens a lot. Um, so yeah, and then that was just for me. And I think a lot of it was like, even though people were like very academic and it was like a lot of like jargon that wasn't necessarily like parsed apart. And sometimes I was like in workshops, like I really don't know what to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I struggled a lot with like the academic aspect of it and the jargon and the language that was used. Um, because, yeah, like you can see in the Snapchat, like you would just hear these buzzwords over and over again that I hear a lot at Colgate in my classes and things like that. And to be honest, like I just don't, like, I don't know what the contemporality or like discrete, like I don't know what it means. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like that we just think that everyone else around us knows what it means. So we don't have, but actually no one knows. And it just like no. so I was I was frustrated by that um, aspect of it because it was just like you're sitting in this conference of all these academics talking to other academics about their work that's supposed to be like challenging prisms of oppression, but you can only understand it if you've gone through university and probably graduate school and know these this certain language. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know, like after the first workshop that I went to, I was really annoyed by that. And then I saw Dana and I was like, oh, what did you think of yours? And she was like, I can never work in academia. I was like, thank God, because I thought I was the only one. And that's why I want to work with children. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that was just a con, especially since it was after the election. And we all, I don't know, had like a lot of emotional struggles. Um, it, it just felt very like disconnected and that um, not everyone, because I think that like, especially our professors did a great job of challenging some of those things, but it felt like you had to write a certain way that was, yeah, there was just this certain mold that you had to use to fit into this academic framework that I didn't necessarily um, connect with. What was your favorite session at the conference? 
and why? Mm, so my favorite session was actually uh, the session where I got to get exercise from, and it was called like spirituality, belonging, borderline, Native American <coughs> and then Chicano communities organizing and decolonial feminism. Um, and I really liked it because I just liked the way the presenters were. So for some presentations, we had to like sit in a row. Um, and I just that made me feel like I was in a classroom when in a lecture, and I like don't necessarily do well in those settings. So when we came here, when we came to that um, workshop, and I was there with Rolo and Sahara, we sat in a circle, and the presenters were like spread out. Um, and then they made each of us go around and say like where we're from and like where we're coming from, this and that. And at the end, they said that that was important to them because so much of in academia, the idea of like relationships is lost, and the idea of like knowing who's actually sitting mm -hmm. next to you isn't treasured. And then we did a generation exercise where we were we had like three circles. So there was an inner circle and like a circle over that, and then the outer circle. So the inner circle was um, like the new generation. So then the second circle had to tell the new generation like what do you want them to know. And then that like the third circle is the ancestor. So it's like ancestors have to tell both the second generation and the first generation like what's going on. Um, and that was like really emotional because a lot of people in the back were like. We just want you to know that you can call on us like whenever you need us, like spiritually. Um, so I think thinking about aspects, and even I know I do this a lot because I'm not like very religious anymore. I also remove the idea of spirituality from feminism. Mm -hmm. So like I like condemn it and then that way there's no space for it. But being <laughs> in that session, I realized that like there can be a space for spirituality and feminism and also like having relationships and stuff like that. It doesn't always have to be very like secular and like focus on one particular thing. I really like that workshop. Um, I think my favorite was Professor Rios's um, because I think something kind of weird about the way is that all of our a lot of our professors do really cool research, but we never necessarily learn about it. Um, so I, it was, I thought it was really cool to be able to see like Professor Serena and Rios and Morton um, talk about what their <coughs> research is because they don't always get to incorporate that in the classroom. And so and then also Professor Rios was talking about. Uh, pedagogies of the broken hearted. So again, mm -hmm. that like was something that I was actually able to connect with and she, it didn't feel like she tried to um, <laughs> 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 it didn't feel like she was um, trying to like um, remove emotion from it and like she didn't use I mean she definitely used some big words but I don't understand. But like <laughs> it wasn't all of that like and, you know all that stuff. And like she also talked about like um politicizing and de-individualizing heartbreak and I think that especially again after the election that was definitely something that um, mm -hmm. resonated with me and also she talked about our class a class that I took with her and she showed um, like a dance performance that some students in my class had submitted as a video for a project and so it was just really cool to I think they all graduated so they wouldn't even know but it was cool to see like how important that project was to her um, in her broader research, and and she she asked us a question. I was like, oh my god, I do not want to speak in front of all these people, but Dana answered it really well. So it was just cool to think about um, like how our class had impacted her in ways that I might not have thought of, um, even though yeah, I learned a lot from it, but I wouldn't have necessarily realized yeah. that. So. Cool. What were some of the shortcomings of the conference that you distinctly remember? Well, Ashiandra and I went to um, an Afrofuturism um, lecture, and we're really excited because in, in Professor Connor's class, we learned about, or I learned about Afrofuturism. We went to this really cool museum last year in New York City about it, so we were really excited. And we got to this panel, and it was three white women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because Afrofuturism is Whoa. imagining alternative futures for black people. So, so <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, also yeah, so we ended up leaving that one early. Um, that was definitely a slow point. <laughs> yes. So I think like what I said about before about the over programming was done, but definitely the Afrofuturism was like really scary because like since you had to choose which ones you wanted to go to because you couldn't go to them all because they were over like on top of one another, we me and Rachel really picked that one out like 
some special plan did over lunch. We're like, this is the one. We have like five options and we narrowed it down. So we had gone to meet them together. And then we went and it was just like all of these white women. And there's one black woman, but the way they set it up, it was a trap. So they kept the black woman as the fourth presenter. So if you really wanted to like hear something you're interested in, you have to like stay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then we had to stay, listen to the black woman speak to you. Like that's the most respectful thing you can do at this point. And then we had to leave. And that was the downfall. So I want you to check on that. So. Okay, and the last question: What did you learn from the conference that you want to take into your academic work or overall life? Hmm. For me personally, I think I really connected with that first workshop I did, um, and then also with Professor um, Rios's work and Professor Morton's work about making sure that I'm intentional about the things I do, but then also not being afraid to make things personal and to like have emotion because when like especially being at Colgate, like no matter what you do, sometimes people will tell you like research and like the work you do in academia is like objective and it's like emotionless and like everything is like hard based like fact and like it can't be argued and then I thought about it and I was like well everything's really subjective and it's up to your opinion on how you feel um and the idea that like you can remove your emotions from the work you do no matter what you do is also like crazy um so I think that's something that I want to take into my personal life like knowing that I can have emotions and also like be a scholar at the same time and have relations and that doesn't like neither of those things like cancel each other out um yeah I think that was kind of like complaining to Professor Stern about like the academia aspect of it and like certain things that he wants me to do with my thesis that I didn't necessarily agree with and he was <laughs> um but he I think he did help me he was kind of trying to explain to me that like poetry or art and things like that are forms of theory too and so like different forms of theory can help different people in different ways and so even though I might not connect with like certain types of language maybe it does work for some people and you just have to I guess accept that I don't know so I'm still kind of thinking about that um I also want to warn about um, a book by Alison Bechdel who wrote Fun Home I yeah. forgot what the other book was called but um are you my mother Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and it was um, the it was a disability studies um, workshop, which was really cool because I think a lot of times we that's missing from a lot of things at Colby. Um, and so, and they were kind of talking about like mental illness and disability not being patholog pathologized, and how like sometimes it can be more of a way of life than an illness. And that was really helpful for what I'm writing about in my thesis. So that was cool. I was gonna say something else, but I feel like Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I think also as much as it was really difficult to be in Canada, I think it was helpful for me to just realize <clears throat> that like you leave Colgate and Colgate goes on. Like they don't necessarily need all of us to be here <laughs> and like planning things or doing things all the time, which I think mm -hmm. at some times like I know because you know Allie's the program assistant at Winston, she's like all this stuff is going on at Winston, I'm not there, but at the end of the day, like things still happen and we don't always need to necessarily um, worry about them. or not worry about them but like think of them as our responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Those are the questions that we have. <laughs> um, does anyone else have questions for us or about the conference? Uh, so uh -huh. Uh -huh. You talked, um, I think it was actually from Twitter, but you talked a lot about how um, women's studies, the conference is like very academic and very kind of like has a technical jargon and kind of formal thing. Um, is there any way that the conference like tries to deconstruct those things or like are any skills you learned that like can deconstruct the like <laughs> academic model? I know it's like a very really complicated question, but yeah. Um, there were things called planners. Okay, whatever. There are these things that were like really big. <laughs> there were really big workshops, but and they were set aside so that like at that time they would be the only workshop going on. So there were um it was packed mostly because you're supposed to go to them. And the one we were on the second day, I believe, or actually the third day, was one where there was like artists. Um, so there was Fabiana Rodriguez, um, and then there was an artist like who did music, and then. 
someone who wrote poetry, but like they um, typed in because at the time they were in like they were at Standing Rock. Um, and what I liked about that is Fabiana Rodriguez said this comment that I like truly and wholeheartedly believe that there should be an artist at every single table when we're discussing anything. So whether we're like discussing policy and politics or like we're talking about school or like we're talking about whatever, like you should have artists at the table. So I think that that model would definitely help to like break things down, like finding another form to talk about these things that isn't like someone reading off of a paper and you can't like see anything because like not everyone like learns that way, just like by sitting down and listening. Um, so I think that's one model. I think also people can um, just explain what they're saying. So <laughs> I don't know, just like understand that not everyone there is like a tenured professor or something like that. We're like 20. So <laughs> they just like, this is that what that means and all this other type of stuff. I feel like that also would have been helpful. <laughs> yes, Professor. I just want to say that I was at the conference and there are many things I didn't understand as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also, I just, you know, it's so interesting because women's studies is a new discipline compared to all the other disciplines that are out there and it struggles for legitimacy all the time. Um, is it rigorous enough? Is it legit? Is it a true academic discipline? And so we kind of, you know, created this hole for ourselves, I think. So we're in this highly constrained situation now where we have our own jargon and our own um, language and on the one hand that's that can be very powerful in terms of building solidarity but on the other hand it creates outsiders all the time and it recolonizes like you all are saying so um, I think it's important to keep in mind this is why this has happened you know that there's this constant struggle for legitimacy, even at Colgate, mm -hmm. there's always this sense of like, oh, you at the Women's Studies Center, <laughs> you're activists, you know, you're not rigorous, you're not scholars. So we always have to prove we are doing true scholarship here. Um, so so it's a struggle that we all face. And I'm, I'm constantly dealing with that when I go to that conference. But I have the same thing at my sociology conferences. I have the same thing, I think, for many of my friends who are in Various disciplines that aren't academic, they have their own jargon. You know, every workplace kind of has their own jargon. So it's an issue, it's clearly an issue, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, and I don't know what to do about it. So that just shows no one knew what was wrong. <laughs> 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 yes, please. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about uh, like decoloniality. <laughs> as a theme and like <laughs> like in like I don't know like I guess what it means to you or maybe what you learned about it or maybe how to um, think about it in not a jargon filled way. Okay. I don't know if that's answerable either. To be perfectly either. honest I did not feel like it was well we did miss the keynote speaker so that's <laughs> <laughs> but, to be honest. but I did not really feel like I learned what Decoloniality was. Yeah. And so originally we, that was going to be the first question we found that. And then as Chandra and I kind of realized we didn't know how to explain what we thought it was. But now I'm realizing maybe that's not our fault because they never really told us. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was like, uh, like before I left, there was like something on the website saying that like the idea of like bringing the theme of decoloniality was about like subverting narratives, like their dominant narratives um, on education. and. Yeah, so that like that's the only thing I had going into it. And we did it, you know, because the first day we were driving around trying to find parking and then it, it didn't work, so we went home. Um, and then sorry, what was the other part of your question now? About what you know, I mean, just what, what it means to you. What it means to me, I think it's about I don't know if we'll ever get to this point, but I think for me personally, the way like I work, like I like to like write poetry and that like that's yeah. how I like contain like knowledge. So getting to this point where like turning in a 40 page paper with like all of these citations from like these dead white men is if the only way to say something is like legitimate. Right. Like art pieces can also be like legitimate forms of like knowledge right. and like poetry, like books of poetry can be legitimate forms of knowledge. And I think that that's what it means to me. And that's how I'm trying to look at it in my life. But I don't necessarily like know how to go about it because I think that also as a student, you come against like the same right. walls where like you sometimes want to write like about a certain thing in a certain way. And then your professors are like, you can do that, but I will fail you. Um, so like <laughs> trying to find like that balance. Yeah. Sure. Uh, 
just to add a little bit of context to the keynote, um, I think uh, part of what the uh, scholar did, Leanne Simpson, right? Yeah, part of what Leanne Simpson was doing as an indigenous scholar and writer um, was that she acknowledged that we were on Mohawk territory and she is not Mohawk and she was the keynote mm -hmm. and that like one indigenous woman is not the same as another and so she spent a considerable amount of time setting up um, uh, and like quoting and citing and working with the analysis of Mohawk indigenous fem like feminist scholars um, and honoring how their work had informed her own um, so that it wasn't just a naming of that, but also a like, let's spend time with it and acknowledge and recognize right. and learn from what's happening here. Um, the other thing that I think was interesting about decoloniality and the, the I've only been to NWSA twice, but the, there was a lot more prominence <coughs> for Native American feminists at this um, particular conference than there had been last year at least, um, is that both Natalie Diaz and Leanne Simpson and like every, like most indigenous scholars talked about how Trump didn't change a lot for them. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to try to unsettle that Obama has like, even Fabiana Rodriguez mentioned like, Obama has supported more people than like George W. Bush did. And Obama has not intervened at Standing Rock when he could. So um, trying to kind of suggest that the kind of um, state violence that we're now, that's now very visible to all of us has already been um, quite evident um, mm. and unignorable for uh, indigenous people. But I also wonder how you felt about that, because I know we were all really raw from this <laughs> Trump election and coming from Colgate where it's just so conservative. And then to come somewhere where people were like, yeah, Trump doesn't really change anything for me. Like at first was really off-putting for me to be like, I think it changes some things, but like, um, <laughs> but also that like, yeah, like Obama has also enacted state violence and continues to do so. So I don't know how you were feeling about that too. I think also because everyone in the U.S. says, oh, Trump won, we're going to go to Canada, but Canada has like a pretty violent history against yeah. indigenous mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. I think that was definitely acknowledged um, a lot at the conference, whereas like we don't really hear about that right. usually, like First mm -hmm. Nations people and all. And so, yeah, Canada's not perfect either. It's actually far from perfect. <laughs> so um, I thought that was helpful to kind of think about how we sort of uh, like romanticized places outside of the U.S. Yeah. that mm -hmm. really just the whole world's kind of. For me, I think going along with the fact that I was like, like so, like very much angry. I think that I had a hard time like grappling with that, but then like also understanding that I was coming from a different place. Um, because on for the plenary, uh, the two Native women that spoke like both days were like we're not able to be there or that had been to standing rock and were like coming from there so they were like yeah you like live in this world where you like think there's like presidency like changes your lives but like people are being closed down because they want clean water also still in the u.s while obama's president so like this doesn't do anything for us um and i had to like just come to grips with the fact that like that was like their lived experience obviously and it was like the truth too um but then like still just being very upset because i feel like it changes some or maybe it changes like a lot of things and I think that's sometimes worth saying you know saying that to like try to find a coping mechanism so I know that my mom's all like well you know it doesn't matter like who's president because like God's on the phone and I was like wow so it's like just like with my mom like I just sort of have like let it go because I also don't need like I don't have a perfect way of articulating it or finding a coping mechanism or like knowing what to say. So I just like sort of kind of sat there and I was like, you're right, you're right. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to the question you raised sure. more about like decoloniality and I think the fact that it was hard to come away with a definition was part because there was not even like a there's no common agreement or definition mm -hmm. here among scholars. Right. You know, I mean I think there's debates even about it, and sometimes one of the things that happens in huge conferences, there's a theme, and then everyone is supposed to write through that term, but not everybody really knows the even the terminology and like the work and that conversation. And there's dilution even of decoloniality, which is part of what the scholarship critiques, right? Like right. decolonization is not a metaphor, um, right? And so like and to be contribute to the conversation, like you, you should kind of have read multiple, you know perspective on the debate about it and not everybody that's using that in the conference 
I would ever say doing that, you know? So, so I think that's partly also why, you know, you can come out of there and not right. have a comment and very clearly definable. Because it's not even commonly agreed. You know, it's, it's kind of, and I think one is how it's theorized right within like indigenous feminism, but then there's also the ways in which we talk about it. How do we deconstruct colonial forms of knowledge, colonial logic, like colonial right. occupation? There's so many ways in which we you don't know, what decoloniality means and looks like. But then it's like, how do we link these various mm. aspects of it? And right. I think it's hard to do that in a huge conference where I think I'll mention everybody's separated into these things. And it's not really a conversation, it's like a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, it's not dialogue a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's hard because that's yeah. like the, the hope and the style things of a conference where everybody comes in and thinks about things collectively. But it's really hard to have that happen in this huge space where everybody's in small classrooms and all like the things that like, professors will mention about the tensions of like legitimacy in the academy and for us as you know like as scholars like because that's part of what that's part of like seen as our job of you know like of our scholarship job but then it's also doesn't always doesn't help the conversation with the things that we would have to do right so it's all these different barriers totally but to me, the way I observe, like, I can observe the tensions of our field and like, what should we come back and talk to, you know, with, right? Because it's linked. You see it right. right now. The tensions of how we speak in ways that are not inclusive or that are, it's hard. You know, when you do come into our boroughs of, of language, even, and they're disciplinary too, right? Because there's people that are philosophers, there's education people, there's, you know, art people, and we all speak different languages, even in that. Yeah. And then we're trying to talk about, you know, so those are the real challenges of knowledge. If another group wanted to go to a conference, how do they get funding? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I can do the like the process for this. I get a um, like a funding application for another conference. So what happens is that we went and we told Ali, we're like, hey Ali, there's this thing coming up. We think it's really cool. We think it'd be beneficial for the interns in the center to go and have a different perspective away from full gaze. And Ali's like, that's great. Um, <laughs> you have to go through the BAC. So then you and another intern or another person could write a proposal about that conference you want to go to and like find all the information on their website. You have to also like find out the cost and things like that if you need like a visa. Um, to travel so then you do all that and then you um, show a tally and like submit to the BAC and then if the BAC thinks you're like worthy or it's like on time you get like a time slot to like present about like why you think you need to go to this conference and then they can either give you no money um, give you some money so then you have to figure out what to do or give you all the money you want so that's nice um, and then I think for conferences I believe you always have to like so everything you do for the BAC has to be about how does this also help the Colgate community because everything apparently is about Colgate. Um, so then you have to like write in that. So for us, we thought that doing this brown bag and also later, I believe, a mural would be giving back to the community like what we got from the conference. So yeah, it's like a tedious process, but it's worth it. I'll just add that Ali and I went a little bit early. We were there right as the election was being called. <laughs> Um, and it was because if you're a director of a program or a coordinator of a program, then you come early and meet with others who are doing that same work. And that's when you realize, I mean, any year when I go to this, I realize how unique Colgate is. First of all, we're the only program that I know of that has a center and a academic program together. Right. Usually there's a women's center, and if you go to grad school, you'll notice this, like somewhere across the campus, where the activism and the support happens, and then you have the academic program mm -hmm. that's very separate. So mm -hmm. we have something very unique yeah. going on here that we have to thank our founders for mm -hmm. um, and their vision. And then secondly, I hear constant stories this year, especially about programs that are going to be closed because of the mm -hmm. next four years and the funding, the funding streams. And so if they were already uh, vulnerable financially, they're probably either going to merge with other programs like ALST and um, I'm trying to think about like Asian studies, you know, anything that's perceived as, you know, marginality studies sure. <laughs> will then be pushed together. Um, and that's already <laughs> happening across the country and in public institutions especially, but 
to know that we're in an institution where the funding is not an issue and it won't be over the next four years is pretty amazing. So I always come away from that conference feeling like we're we're in an extremely privileged situation here, and and yet the state of women's studies is, you know, questionable for the future, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of programs. I don't know, Ali, if you want to share anything about what I mean, you learned from the big picture. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that was brought up with directors and coordinators was that. Trump leveraging Trump's election because there's going to be and it's already happening where schools want these diversity band-aids kind of these yeah. like solutions that are quick fix yeah. so that these kinds of jobs are opening up everywhere and like there is like a real need for the work that we're doing but it's making sure that it's sustainable and not seen as a band-aid not seen as like just while you know, abortion rights are up in the air, we might need a women's center. Or like just while, you know, we have like deportations might be more prominent right now, we need a Latinx like uh, center or something, you know, so making sure that those are more sustainable than just like following the wave of current events. Um, so I think that was a conversation that was coming up a lot. Thank you for listening to us. <laughs> Thank you for listening to us.